If you're going to host a conference on the brain and consciousness at Caltech, you don't have to go far to get good speakers, Caltech itself. We have two. Our next speaker is Christoph Koch, who is a professor of um, cognitive and behavioral biology, where he studies the neural correlates of consciousness right here on campus. Christoph uh, was born in the American Midwest in Kansas City. You were born in, Ka you're from Kansas? Oh, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> However, he escaped. <laughs> and he grew up in Amsterdam, Holland, Bonn, Germany, Ottawa, Canada, and in Morocco. <laughs> so you can try to figure out the accent when, you know, you hear the talk here. It's quite unique. We graduated from the Lycée Descartes with a French baccalaureate in 1974. He studied physics and philosophy in Tübingen, Germany, and was awarded his Master's of Physics in 1980, and a PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Tübingen in 1982. His dissertation was on nonlinear information processing in dendritic, in dendritic trees of arbitrary geometry. We have his more popular version for sale out here. <laughs> Christoph worked for 16 years in collaboration with the great Francis Crick, who made a career change, as only he could, from studying uh, DNA to studying consciousness, which at the time was not really a, an acceptable thing for real scientists to do, it is now. And, uh, and his book, uh, basically on the neural Correlates of Consciousness is, uh, is a terrific book. It's, it's really the best place to begin to study consciousness at, again, at that level and up, from up, not further down, from up. Um, in, uh, in, 19, uh, in 2000, um, Christoph and his son Alexander joined an archaeological expedition to dig up part of the temple built by King Herod in 20 BC in Caesarea along the Mediterranean coast. While he was there, he had an Apple tattoo, Apple logo tattooed on his bicep. And in addition to signing your book, he will show you <laughs> his tattoo later today. He says, and I quote, together with the Boeing 747 jumbo jet and the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, the Apple Macintosh is the most beautiful and elegant artifact of the 20th century. <laughs> And no, it's not an iron-on or HEMA tattoo. It's actually the real thing. With that, please help me welcome Dr. Christoph Koch. I'm going to show you a 40-minute clip. So I actually turn a talk like our governor does, <laughs> uh, even though I was born in Kansas City. So I'll, um, I'll, okay, so I'll give you three little vignettes, three little stories about uh, how to study consciousness at the, uh, at the, at the, at the level of, of brains. As Michael um, mentioned, I'm, I work with uh, 20 years with, um, um, uh, with uh, Francis, and he was my mentor and my colleague and my friend for many, many years, and I miss him greatly almost every day. Uh, I have this dialogue with him uh, carrying on in my, in my head every time I, I listen to some new facts or some new theory about the brain. And uh, together we, um, we postulated, and, um, um, uh, and this was done at a time when indeed it wasn't very popular for scientists for physical scientists to study, uh, to study consciousness. So we said, let's not worry too much about the philosophical problems about consciousness, like qualia and um, um, intentionality and other highfalutin words that philosophers have, but let's worry about something that we can do today as brain scientists or as psychologists or as, as people in the clinic studying patients, namely we can study the correlates of, the, uh, the correlates of consciousness in the brain, in particular the minimal, con the minimal uh, correlates in the brain that are sufficient jointly sufficient for any one conscious percept. So by conscious percept, we mean, you know, if you, if you hear, for example, if you're conscious of my voice, my funny accent, if you, hear, if you see blue, if you're conscious of a pain, if you're conscious of being angry, if you're conscious of being you, those are all different, they're all different in content, but what they all share with each other, all these different states, is the subjective stance. They're all about something. They all feel like something. And, and as biologists, of course, we believe that there's evolutionary continuity across species, and certainly we share consciousness with many creatures, if not with all, certainly with mammals, and most certainly with higher mammals, such as uh, mice, 
and monkeys and apes, the great apes. And if you look at the behavior of animals, for example, if you take a typical um, monkey, train him in a, in a typical visual task, and you take your typical undergraduate, <laughs> statistically, statistically, uh, as long as uh, the person doesn't have to talk, the behavior is really, um, is really very similar. If you look at the hardware, if you look at the brain itself, you know, um, if I give you a cubic millimeter, if I give you a little grain of rice of monkey brain matter, of human brain matter, of mice brain matter, there's maybe only two or three people in the audience like John Orman who, who could tell the difference. Because at the level of the hardware, our brain is bigger. It's not the biggest, right? They're much bigger brains like whales or dolphins. But uh, so, so it's, it's, it's difficult to say what's actually unique about the human brain at the, at the level of the, of the hardware. And certainly if you have you know, pets in your, own, in your own life, cats or dogs, wonderful creatures, that you, you, it's certainly easy to, to infer that they also have, they also have, uh, have states of, of, of seeing, of smelling, of hearing. They can also have emotional states. Where it ends, it's very difficult to say right now. What species, I mean, it's not, a, it's not an all or none property, it's a gradual property, and where exactly it ends right now, we don't know, because we still don't really understand the neural basis of consciousness. So the idea is for now, let's not worry about too much about philosophy, uh, uh, because we haven't really made too much progress over the last 2,500 years on that topic, but let's study the <laughs> correlates. You can read Plato and you can read a modern, um, you know, much, not all, but you can read uh, much of modern philosophy and you don't really have the feeling that there is progress. <laughs> so um, underlying, uh, underlying every one <laughs> conscious percept, uh, whether, you know, in, in us or in, in, let's say, in a monkey, is the idea that there's some subset of neurons, some coalition of neurons that briefly coalesce, that briefly comes together. By briefly, I mean a fraction of a second you know, reflecting the, the time scale of your mental life. Your conscious things flitter in and out of consciousness. You're conscious of my voice, and maybe next second you feel, you know, you have a, you have a painful toe. Your consciousness shifts down there. Then you remember something you should have done, and your consciousness... So it's ever, ever more shifting about. And the correlate of that, ultimately what, cause, what gives rise to that, but of course right now we don't know, so we are careful as scientists. We talk about correla correlation rather than causation. So the, the correlates of that is going to be a set of neurons. You have to imagine, you have this brain. It's the most complex system we know of in the known universe. It has 100 billion neurons. And probably only a small subset of those neurons are responsible for any one conscious state. So most of the time, most of the activity in your brain, you're unconscious of, and happily so. In fact, there are many parts of your, for instance, I don't know if you know, most of you, well, all of you, will have a, a brain down here. It's called the enteric nervous system. There are roughly 100 to 200 million nerve cells down here. And you have no idea what they do, and you don't want to know what they do. <laughs> and very rarely you do know, you know, when you feel nauseated, when you want to throw up. So, so um, or the other parts of your body, like the immune system, highly sophisticated system you're not conscious of. We have a part of the brain called the cerebellum here at the back. We, there's no evidence that we're conscious of, uh, conscious of activity in the cerebellum. So just because it's a, it's a complex coll a collection of, of nerve cells doesn't mean you're conscious of. And probably you're only conscious of a, of a very small part of it. And only, or conversely, only a very small part of the nervous system at any given point in time is responsible for generating a particular conscious state. And that's a, co a coalition of neurons, and you can bias those with, with attention, and they sort of, they come together at a fraction of a second, then they fall apart. And of course, our job as, uh, as scientists is to try to observe these coalitions. And since we don't know how to tag them, you have this 200, you know, you have this big brain of 100 billion neurons, and we have very crude tools. Either we have functional imaging where we can just see large fraction of a brain light up at a very slow time scale, the very sluggish time scale, or we can put in individual uh, pieces of metal wire in a, per, in a head of a patient or in a head of an animal to observe one or two neurons at, in, in great detail. But what we really need to do, we need to be able to observe individual neurons, but, you know, hundreds of millions of them at the same time. And right now we don't have, our tools are very impoverished. So the, it, it, the, the great realization over the, hundred, over the last hundred years is there are many, many brains inside your head, as it were. There are many automatic systems. Francis and I call them zombie systems for obvious reasons. <laughs> That, that control your behavior that either don't involve consciousness at all or that, to, or, or that only involve consciousness after the fact. So if you do things like, like, and like Michael used to do for a living, if, you, if, you are, if you're a professional biker or you're a runner or you play tennis or you bike or you drive or you climb or you dance or you do all the other things that we love to do, particularly if you do it at an expert level, you do it effortlessly, unconsciously, mindlessly. You're just in the act. What happened there, you had to be exquisitely conscious while you trained up these systems. And then once you become conscious of them, you can dispense a different part of the brain takes over, and you can do these things without thought. And that's a great boon because you don't 
don't need to, th because thinking, consciousness takes time. And so in a split second, when, when you know, time really counts, it's disadvantaged to really think about them, to think about those things. And, and so the, I mean, and there's lots of clinical evidence, there's lots of evidence from, from the lab in, in normal people and in animal studies that all sorts of things, including such mundane things as reaching out and grabbing something, moving your eyes. You move your eyes as often as your heart beats. Yet you're utterly, by and large, 99.99% of, of the time, you're utterly unaware of the fact that you move your eyes or how you move your eyes. You don't have a conscious access to that. So what we have to explain is the difference. Why are there so many things that don't require consciousness and a few things that do require consciousness. And where this allows us also to track where in the brain is the difference, right? We can look at using brain imaging or using other fancy tools. We can try to see where the parts of the brain that are, in, that are necessary or that are involved in generating this unconscious behavior as compared to the part of the brain that are necessary for co generating conscious behavior. Are the neurons different? Do they look different? Do they go in a different mode? Are they in a different part of the brain? Those are all questions people ask. Here's a great quote from a very uh, a gem of the meditative literature I really liked, written by a germ who lived in Japan between the wars. And at the last chapter in this book on archery, it also talks about sword fighting. And he cites this, uh, what, a Zen art, what a Zen master told him. The pupil must develop a new sense, or more accurately, a new alertness of all of his senses, which will enable him to avoid dangerous thrust, as though he could feel them coming. Once he's mastered the art of evasion, he no longer needs to watch with undivided attention the movements of his opponent or even of several opponents at once. Rather, he sees and feels what is going to happen, and at that same moment, he's already avoided its effect without there being a hair's breadth between perceiving and avoiding. This, then, is what counts, a lightning reaction which has no further need of conscious observation. In this respect, at least, the pupil makes himself independent of all conscious purpose, and that's a great gain. And if you read many, many sports, you know, if you, read, if you read motivational literature, if you read books on, you know, how to climb 512, if you do things like that, it's always being in the zone, not thinking, just being all mindless in the action. And so, you know, you have to explain, we can do all these sophisticated things without consciousness. So one question is, why do you need consciousness at all? And B, as I mentioned already, where's, where's the difference in the brain between conscious and unconscious action? You need consciousness because for all the things that you didn't plan for, you know, we all know we live in Southern California. Suddenly if there's an earthquake here. You really have to think, okay, it's the first time I've been here. Where's the exit? Where's everybody running towards? How can I get out of this building in safety? You've never planned that before. That's what you need consciousness for, for the unexpected things in life, the, ones, the things that you haven't rehearsed over and over again. But I mean, this is all nice making, you know, may, uh, you know, speculating as people have done over the last 100 or 200 years, but uh, ultimately has to come down to empirical things that you can test and prove and disprove because that's how science works. So um, the experimental program that, by and that many people now throughout the world, I mean, many scientists adopt is the following. So first of all, char characterize the neural college of consciousness using all sorts of tools, imaging tools, study them in, 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 in normal people, study them in the clinic, study them in animal. If you, if you want to study in animals, which ultimately you have to do, if you really want to uncover the circuits responsible for consciousness, just like we want to uncover the molecules responsible for carrying my, passing my information on to my descendant, we like to understand what are the specific circuit and what part of the brain that are involved for that. Obviously, you can't do that in humans, so you need to, you need to go to animal models, where you can also then allow you to move from correlation to causation. Ultimately, we, we want a final theory of consciousness, a scientific theory of consciousness. So what we want, we want to be able to say not just when I think of blue, these neurons are active, and when I smell mom's apple pie, these neurons are active, but I want to be able to say which system under what condition will have these things called subjective states. And is that restricted to biological creatures? Is it restricted to, to, to evolved creatures? Or can we also build artificial creatures? Is this wonderful thing, for example, a Macintosh? Is this thing, for example, conscious? Could it be conscious? And in what condition could it be conscious? That's, that's, what, I mean, that's sort of the dream of a final theory of consciousness. So in the meantime, we need to have something like a Turing test. We, we need to be able to say in, in, in subjects that don't necessarily talk, either because they're babies. How do we know that a very young a newborn baby is actually conscious? We don't, actually. Um, what, I mean, what about we saw Terry Schiavo, right, last month, tragic case, and there are 10,000 of, of people like that with what's called persistent vegetative syndrome, PBS, where we don't know whether they're conscious or not, or are they occasionally conscious, and so we, 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 need, we need a test for those. And of course, we want a test for non-linguistic uh, uh, subjects like, like monkeys or like mice or maybe even like bees, or like flies, or like C. elegans. We need to have some, some a battery of behavioral tests that, test, that uh, enable us to test if this species or this individual can pass these batteries of tests. Then, you know, by these and these definitions, I assume that the subject is, is, um, is conscious. 
Okay, so let me tell you three little stories how you can test these things in the lab. So one is, can we have the lights off? Is there, is there, and can we just dim the lights? Thank you. So just keep, this a simple illusion, just look at the star, look at the cross, don't move your eyes, keep them open. Don't move your eyes and tell me what you see. Okay, you should all see a blue sphere, do you? Yes? Yes? Okay, otherwise you should see me afterwards. <laughs> now, if you, if you just keep your eyes fixed at the cross, you should also see something else. Okay, good, good, a good audience. Okay, so, so, the, so the yellow square, it's a nice illusion discovered by these people here a couple of years ago. It's a nice illusion, it's called motion induced blindness, and the point is sometimes you see the yellow and sometimes you don't. You've got to trust me, I'm a scientist, I'm not cheating. I mean, the, the yellow squares are always present. In fact, you can find out yourself because when it disappears for you, it, it may not disappear for your neighbor. So, it's a, so you know, I, I give a lot of talks to philosophers these, these days, and they always ask me, of course, how do you define consciousness? And I can't, really. It's like very often in an early phase of a scientific exploration of something, you can't really rigorously define it. But what I mean by consciousness is sometimes you see them. Then you can talk to your neighbor about the yellow. You have, you know, it may remind, remind you of, you know, the yellow Van Gogh sunflowers or something. You're conscious of it, and sometimes you don't. It's just not present. You're not conscious of it. Where's the difference in the brain? It's a very simple question. Where's the difference in the brain when you see the yellow, when you don't see the yellow? Okay, second illusion. Just keep me, keep me happy and fixate. Keep your eyes fixed on the cause, okay? I'm going to show you the oldest tool in psychology. It's called an after effect. It's around since several hundred years. And um, just keep your, while I talk, just don't move your eyes. Keep your eyes fixed on the, uh, on the cause. And um, sort of try to remember while you keep your eyes fixed, there's red in the upper left and there's green in the upper right. Oh. Sorry, the other way around. Oh, I just wanted to test you. Okay, so just keep your eyes fixed, and what do you see now? Quick, 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 what do you see? Okay, so obviously it worked. So A, this disproves the simple, the simple naive proposition that most of us have. Most of us, when we first think about consciousness, we think, well, it's pretty obvious. There's a world outside there, and there's a conscious mind inside my skull, and there's a very simple mapping between the outside world and, the, and the, the objective outside world, here I can measure, and the inside world that's only accessible to me. In this case, it's obviously not, because when you look after a while, what you see is really just a gray surface. But because of this, I, I adapted you, you looked at, at these different colors for half a minute, your, 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 your retina slightly changed, therefore you saw for a couple of seconds, you saw these very vivid colors although physically they were not present. So in this case, at least, there's no simple dissociation. There's a simple dissociation between what's out in the world and what's inside your head. Now, if you, if you remember this illusion I showed you, you can now ask the simple, oh, I don't have, do we have a laser pointer? Okay, I think it's coming. Thank you. Thank you, that was very quick. Okay, so we can now go back and ask a simple question. When I, if, if you look at those yellows and I show you a gray, ski, a gray screen afterwards, you should be able to see an uh, after effect, just like before. It'll be faintly blue, and you get it. Now, the question is, if you don't see it, for the time that you didn't see the yellow, will you still get an after effect? So you can ask a question in the lab that seems totally nonsensical and stupid. Do you need to see something in order to get an after effect to it, okay? You need to see yellow in order to get the after effect for yellow, which is blue. Well, the clear and unambiguous answer is, which we did with a, with a graduate student, no. You do not need to see the, um, you, do, you do not need to see the yellow. The, uh, so so w what we essentially tested is the strength of the after effect. Does it depend on, on the duration of, uh, uh, of suppression of yellow? So in other words, you look at all the cases where yellow was suppressed for two seconds, but where it was present on your eye compared to when you saw it for two seconds. And you do that over many trials, over many subjects, and you see this clear and unambiguous answer. Whether or not you see it makes absolutely no difference to the after effect. So besides sort of being acute observation, wh why is that interesting? Well, it tells us something about the correlates of consciousness in the brain. It tells us that the correlates of consciousness for seeing color, uh, for seeing after effects, has to come in the processing hierarchy after the stage where the, where the after effect occurs. And the after effect is believed to occur by and large in the retina. So what this tells us, which is something we knew before, that you don't see with your eyes. 
You don't see with your retina. You need your retina in order to capture the photon to translate them into an action potential that is sen then sent up this, this, this cable to the, to the visual cortex at the back of your head, but you don't need the eyes in order. The eyes are not, the neurons in the eyes do not generate conscious perception. That's done at a higher stage. So you can do this very simple demonstration. And you can also do more fancy version work, for example, other after effects, like you get an after effect, this is a little bit more technical, you get an after effect for gratings, this one also, you don't need to see the grating consciously in order to get the after effect. This one you do, however. This we did with a professor who's here, um, also at Caltech, Shin Shimojo. If you, if you don't see a face, you don't get a face-specific after effect. So you can sort of, it helps you locate in the processing hierarchy of the brain where is visual consciousness. And it argues against the position that many people have, which is sort of a little bit mysteri mysterious, that people say, well, consciousness is a holistic property of the brain. It's a global holistic property of the brain. You can't associate with specific circuits. It's a little bit like people 100 years ago who said heredity, you know, is associated with the entire organism, and there were many people like that. In fact, the majority of people around 1900 believed that, that, that heredity did not reside in anything as specific as a molecule because we didn't have any understanding of the amazing power of macromolecules to store information. And so we think, Francis and I always had this bias that it's gonna be very similar Consciousness, there are very specific circuits located in specific parts of the brain that are responsible for conscious sensation. Okay, let me show you a second experiment. This is called something change blindness. It's a, it's a fun little illusion. Well, actually, it's quite, I mean, science tells us how things are, whether we like them or not. So this tells us that when we think we see everything, right? I open my eyes, I, of course, see all of you, clearly in front of me. I clearly see you. Well, what this shows you, that very often you don't. So this is, an, this is two pictures, and they're doctored. There's one thing that's different here. Now, don't say, don't call out what it is, okay? Please don't ruin it for your, for your fellows, colleagues, attendees. So just lift your hand if you see where the difference is. Okay, so there are about half of you. Do you see the difference? There. Do you want to meet? Do you know what the bad side of this is? The IQ is inversely correlated to the reaction time. <laughs> it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. It's not true as far as we know. Okay, this is a homegrown version. These are my three dogs at home and, you know, again, do you, I mean, I mean, lift your hand when you see the finger, when, when you see the, no, consider fewer of you. It's very clear. I mean, once you see it again, it's, it's totally obvious. The carpet here, right? Okay, we can do, we can do another one. Um, this is, a this is a little bit different. This is one that requires really your, all your attention, so I'm, I have to ask you to be very quiet, okay, and not make any noises, uh, um, particularly when you, when, you, when you laugh, when you, when you see it, it's gonna ruin it for your, for your neighbor, so just don't say anything. You really have to pay attention. This is an attention task. There are two sets of people here. There are three people in white shirts and three people you see the other here, here, and here in black, in black, sh in black shirts, and they have two, uh, two basketballs, one each. And you, uh, your task is to count how often these pe the white people, the people in white t-shirt, pass the ball to each other. I see most of you saw it. <laughs> How many people saw it? Oh, many of you didn't, okay. So for those of you who didn't, I'm just gonna replay this clip. It's quite dramatic. <laughs> it's difficult to believe that your visual system is this bad. So just out of curiosity, how many people missed the gorilla? Okay. Okay, so this is called change blindness, and we, it should give us pause when we, you know, when we read about witnesses and testimonies, and you know, in, in criminal trials, 
when people say, yes, of course, I, I, I saw the perpetrator, it was him or it was her, and very often, of course, these things, the, 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 the moral here is that if things are unexpected, that here I pre queued you and you had to pay attention to these people in white, and then totally unexpected, this gorilla walks across the stage. And uh, um, very often, your, your visual system misses these things just because you, you didn't attend to it. You did not attend to this event, and you didn't expect it. Therefore, you may totally miss it, although it's present for many seconds. This is a trick. This is a millennial trick. This is what magicians do, okay? You go to a magic show. You have a magician. He has a beautiful bikini-clad assistant, okay? She distracts you, and the, the magician makes things disappear in front of you that if you go to the same show two or three times and you're not distracted by her, you can perfectly well see. But, but um, with attentional um, manipulation, you may totally miss these things. So it's, it's, uh, yet we have this feeling, we have this illusion, it turns out, that we see everything all the time. Now let's, let's do it a little bit more boring because we're scientists after all, right? We have to have personalities. So let's go in a magnet and let's, let's do the, the scientific version of this. So what we ask you to do, we ask you to fixate here. Don't move your eyes, look at here. And you see the orientation of these rings will flip every 10 or 15 seconds. They move about, they flick a little bit, but occasionally they'll, they'll, they'll flip by 90 degrees. And sometimes you'll see some of these changes and sometimes you don't. So you always fixate here and we check that with eye movements. And sometimes this, for example, flipped. And I think it's gonna, here, it just flipped. I don't know if you saw it. So it's a difficult task and we, we um, and so sometimes you see it and you have buttons where you, where you tell us, okay, I saw this flip or I saw this flip. So we can now compare what happens in your brain. What we do, we put you in a magnetic scanner and we, sort of conceptually look at your brain. Okay, you, this is your eyes, this is the back of your head. You can feel it, there's a little bump here at the back of your head. You can all feel it? A little bit above the uh, bump, like, a, you know, uh, like maybe half an inch is, your visual, is your, your visual cortex. So the output of your eyes, the optic nerve, goes to the, uh, to the back here. And then we can sort of analyze it in great detail. The different visual areas here called V1, the first visual area, and V2 and V3, et cetera, et cetera. So we can essentially look at your brain activity. And we can now, now it's very sluggish, as I mentioned before, we, because we're actually not looking at neurons, we're looking at the power consumption of neurons. So at this scale, you have time. At zero uh, second, the, the image flips. And here, this is 10, 20 seconds after the image flipped. And we ask, well, we look at now your activity in this first part of your brain, primary visual cortex, and we ask, what is the activity if you saw the change? So if you saw the change, it's called hit. So you get this increase in blood flow and then a decrease corresponding to neurons firing, and then for some reason, people don't really understand there is a reduction in blood flow. Okay, more, much more surprising is uh, the red one. The red one is when you thought there was a change, but there wasn't, you made a mistake. It was, for example, in a neighboring location, or there wasn't anything at all, you just got confused, okay? So you thought there was a change, you believe erroneously was a change, but there wasn't a change. Well, your brain activity re reflects what you actually thought there was. Also. It wasn't there, okay? So in this case, in the very f earliest part of the, of the visual cortex already, you get something that reflects this subjective feeling, the subjective state, the, the, conscious, the visual consciousness, rather than the physical, the change in the physical signal. And conversely, when, when you missed it, so when, it was, when there was a physical change there but you didn't see it, you get this reduction in, in activity. And you can do this using, this is sort of the footprint, the footprint of, 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 actually, seeing, of actually seeing the change. So here, what turns out very early on, you can, you can, to the surprise of lots of us, uh, um, to lots of visual scientists, including myself, you see already in the first part of the visual brain, if you're looking at hemodynamic, you're seeing something that reflects the subjective percept rather than the physical signal that comes in. So if you do this in experiment in the retina, you, you would only get physical change. The retina only cares about the physical input. It doesn't care about the subjective percept. But surprisingly, very early on, it changes already. The last study, which we do together with, an, um, with a neurosurgeon and a, a brilliant neurosurgeon, neuroscientist, Itzhak Fried in, at UCLA. So what he does, he implants people with, um, with, with microelectrodes. These are, these are patient, epileptic patients that, um, that the drugs don't work anymore. And so then what they do, it's a very successful operation. They go inside, they go to a neurosurgeon, and the neurosurgeon takes out the part of the brain that gives rise to the, to the, to the seizure. In many patients, you can look from the outside using MRI or CT scan, you can locate, the, you can pinpoint where the part of the brain is from which the seizure originates. You can't do that in, in, in many patients. So then what you have to do, what Itzhak Fried does, he inserts these microelectrodes into the brain. 
So you have 12 of these microelectrodes inside the brain now. For, and they're left there, in the, they're left inside the brain for three or five or six days. The patient moves around the, the hospital, you know, sleeps there and watches TV, talks to his parents, etc. for as long as it takes for him to have three to five seizures. And then the patient is monitored 24-7 with these big electrodes here from these metal leads. And so you can essentially monitor, you can do, in, it's like EEG by doing it inside the brain. And then you can pinpoint where the foci is, you take out the electrode and you take out the part of the brain. Okay, it's, it's a very successful operation. Now what these patients are, are willing to do, because of course we have to get their permission, is that what Free does, he hollows out, <laughs> he hollows out the, uh, the volume of these and inserts tiny wires. So now in addition to having these big electrodes, you can see it on the MRI, there are these tiny wires that go to the end here which allows us to do something. It's a fantastic opportunity that, 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 that we have grace of these uh, patients because it allows us to do what we can otherwise only do in animals. We can now listen in to individual neurons chatting away, talking to each other using the action potential code that we can decode uh, in a living conscious person where we can directly ask, are you conscious of this or are you not conscious of that? So here, for example, you have a patient sits there, you have a, a turban, he has these electrodes there, and then you know, the, the, the wires go to a bad stand, and there we, you know, we have a computer for, for recording it all and analyzing it. So we, we, have, a, we have a paper coming out next a couple of weeks from now about this, describing this in great detail. So this is some old data I'm showing in the meantime. So here, here this is the only technical graph I have. This shows time. Now this is, the this is the relevant time scale for consciousness. It's not seconds, it's fraction of a second. So the, the time between those two vertical takes is one second. So this total thing is three seconds long. And this, the x-axis, shows the activity. Here we show the individual action potential. So neurons, you may know, talk to each other using, using individual pulses. You can put them on an audio monitor. You can actually listen to them. And so here you show, when we show this patient this fractal pattern, the neuron doesn't respond. This is before the image. We put the image on at this time, leave it on for one second, then we remove the image. The patient doesn't respond, the neuron doesn't respond to this picture, or hardly, a little blip here. But if we put up this picture, this photograph, the neuron fires very strongly. We put up another picture of Bill Clinton and his wife and somebody else fires very strongly. We put up a line drawing of Bill Clinton, fires very strongly. Doesn't respond to other famous males. It uh, doesn't respond, didn't respond to President Bush. This was done. <laughs> This was done uh, six years ago. It doesn't respond to other famous male. We have other neurons here that respond to the Beatles, a neuron here that responds to Simpson. We now have a whole collection of, <laughs> of, of neurons that respond to folks on Jennifer Aniston or Terry, to, to, to famous people. It responds to famous people because that's the subject material we use to test. We know there are neurons that respond to things that you are very familiar with, like your mother, you know, your, your loved ones, the people you are at work, and of course, and celebrities. So we show this being LA, we show lots of celebrities, and by and large, we find individual neurons that respond selectively to individual celebrities. Like here we, you know, with, um, uh, I mean here, um, you can see that we have these neurons from, from Fried's lab that respond to this particular celebrity. We can now also ask question, what about imagery? What about if you close your eyes? Okay, close your eyes and remember back, for example, the picture I showed you of my three dogs. You can perfectly well remember that picture, right? And most of us can have visual images. So now again, we can directly test because this you can't do in an animal, right? Because you can't ask them close your eyes and imagine something. So now, for example, here we have a neon that responds to a picture of uh, the beetle, um, Paul McCarthy. So every time we show the picture for one second, you get this action potential. When we show, for example, the picture of this house, the neuron doesn't respond, or responds only very weakly, but it responds quite nicely to the picture of McCarthy. Here we ask now the patient for three seconds, close your eyes. We do it for three seconds because it takes some time to paint this mental picture. Think of the picture of, uh, you know, uh, remember Paul McCarthy, think about Paul McCarthy, think about the, the house, think about McCarthy, and you can see whenever the, the patient's being asked to think of McCarthy, the neon fire is much stronger than if the patient is being asked to think about uh, the house. So you get the same selectivity. So we can now do a lot of studies of consciousness where we can manipulate what's, uh, what's out there and what's inside the head while monitoring the neurons. So the, 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 the long-term strategy is to study the neural basis of consciousness in animals. I haven't talked about that today. There's no time. Or on humans. For, for what you ultimately want to identify, you want to identify the specific neurons. And then the big step is, the big step we need to do, we need to move to 
correlate, uh, to causation. We got to go away from just observing, okay, this correlates with that, because, you know, we, we, we want to establish a final science of consciousness. So there, um, in humans, we can do certain things like we can do neuroprosthetic devices. It's done, for example, here at Caltech by Richard Anderson, where you can implant electrodes inside the brain for the patient, for example, when you're in a locked-in syndrome or you have a paralyzed patient, you can read out their thoughts. You can do what's something called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is not to be confused with the, the people who, who levitate, <laughs> uh, where you stimulate parts of their brain. But this is all very crude. What you really want to do, if you, you, we need to be able to interfere delicately, deliberately, transiently, reversibly in the brain, and that we can only do in animals. Lastly, people tell me, well, this is all very fine, and we believe you, you know, at some point you'll know, you, you'll understand the correlates, but you're forever going to miss something. Why? Well, you know, because we know, we, we know that, you can, that, you know, that, that, that consciousness can't be explained by, 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 by anything in, in, in the physical universe. And of course, I, it's a very, very common objection. Now, I found this wonderful quote. Well, this is my last slide. Let me just put it in context. So there's a, some analogy. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an analogy, and so it's not perfect. But the problem of consciousness has an analogy with the problem of origin of, li uh, um, of, of life and heredity. So in the turn of last century, 1900, 1910, 1880, 1890, people had grave conceptual difficulty imagining how mere chemistry that people thought they understood, how mere chemistry that's present in a single cell could possibly explain um, uh, the specificity of uh, genetic information that's passed on from one generation to the next. And so people made all sorts of uh, hypotheses like Elan Vital, Bersant, you know, vitalism. They had all sorts of, of, of explanations how you could do it. And, by, and what they missed was just a detailed understanding of, molecular, of the molecular machinery. They just didn't have that at the time. And this is ex perfectly captured in this quote. Bateson was a, the preeminent geneticist in England. He reviewed in 1916 the book of Thomas Hunt Morgan, who at the time was at Columbia, before he became chairman here at Caltech. And he was the person who established the fly as a molecular model. And he is also the person, in this book, he describes that information, genetic information stored along one-dimensional strings, which we now know to be true. It's a, it's a, it's a genetic code, right? Stored along a one-dimensional string. Of course, he didn't know anything about the molecular basis. And so Bateson, who was a materialist, writes this. The properties of living things are in some way attached to a material basis, perhaps in some special degree to nu nuclear chromatin, the chromosomes. We know that's true now. And yet it is inconceivable, it is inconceivable that particles of chromatin or of any other substance, however complex, can possess those powers which must be assigned to our factors or genes. It's his spelling. <laughs> the supposition that particles of chromatin, i.e. chromosomes, indistinguishable from each other, and indeed almost, that's of course the killer word, almost homogeneous, of course they're not homogeneous, almost homogeneous under any known test can by their material nature confer all the properties of life, surpasses the range of even the most convinced materialism. So we should not make the same mistake twice and come to the same conclusion that just because right now we don't really understand it, we need to call for new laws of physics or let alone new, you know, new other entities. Thank you very much. <laughs>